Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just the warm up. Don't worry, nothing exciting is happening yet. I want to welcome you to Constitution Day Slam. My name is Lynn Brown. I'm executive director of the Bradhamus Center, here with you to celebrate Constitution Day. So my job is to be brief and to offer uh, a tutorial and thank yous. So here's the tutorial. The Bradhamus Center uh, at NYU uh, it was founded and named after former congressman and former president of NYU, John Bradamus. He served in Congress for over two decades and as president of NYU for a decade. And just um, for historical perspective, he wrote when he was in Congress most of the major higher education legislation, including student financial aid, support for the endowment for the humanities and the arts, international education. So he was a good guy and he cared a lot about those issues. He passed away two years ago, and, uh, but his spirit is in the room because what are we doing? We're doing things he loved. Politics, policy, education, arts, and culture, and you're bringing them all together tonight. So thank you. Now, what is Constitution Day? Uh, a burning question of all time. Uh, it actually, September 17th, is the anniversary of the adoption of the United States Constitution in Philadelphia in 1787. Uh, oh, very good, all right. Um, and about 15 years ago, Congress passed a law mandating that colleges and universities on their campuses do some event that raised the visibility of this fact for our students that September 17th is Constitution Day. You can do anything, uh, but I think in typical NYU fashion, it's like, well, we could do anything, and it could be really boring. It probably would be. Um, uh, people could dress up in wigs, powdered wigs, and walk around and read the Constitution, but we're gonna do something really exciting, and we're gonna turn it into a poetry and spoken word slam competition. And so that's what we've done. This is our second year doing this. It, it, absolutely got more votes than just sitting around reading the Constitution because it gets to showcase our talented students, um, faculty, alums, show their creativity, and still show the important thing, was which is how they make the Constitution and its themes relevant to their lives today. So here we go, and now into the, uh, int the thank yous, which include, begin, starting with introducing the judges in whose hands your fate now rests. So we have Professor Catherine Barnett from NYU, College of Arts and Science. Sean DeVigne, professional DJ and author and Beinecke scholar. Yugochi, uh, 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 sorry Yugochi, I got the first part. Yugochi Egano, NYU student and contributor for Rookie Magazine. And, uh, Daniel Gallant, executive director of the New Yorkian uh, Poets Cafe. So a terrific set of judges. Hats off to them. I also want to do a shout out for our uh, friend in the back by her computer. Look at her shouting out right there. This um, actually is one of the representatives from Motivote. Motivote is was founded by three women at NYU Wagner, and it's a new digital tool that helps colleges and universities and students get excited about voting and motivate each other. Just a reminder, September 25th is National Voter Registration Day. Here in New York, you have to register by October 12th. Register to vote, and then vote. I also want to acknowledge the people who brought this to you, which is our inestimable team of Tom McIntyre and Kevin from the Office of Government and Community Engagement, the Bradhamus Center, all of our judges, the New York and Poets Cafe, and NYU Student Slam Group. Now, I'm off, thankfully, and we bring you the really exciting, energetic Siri as your MC. Thank you all. How are we doing tonight, ladies and gentlemen? Good, I hope, uh, come on, come on. How are we doing tonight? Thank you. That sounds a little better. So um, I just wanna say a quick thing about voting. If you're not registered, please register. If you are registered, please bring a friend to get registered. This is probably, you know, midterm elections are probably the most important types of elections. I know we tend to focus a lot on general elections or, um, 
presidential elections, but these midterms can really have an impact not only in New York State government, but also in the Congress. So please take some time to educate yourselves about who's running, take some time to uh, register yourselves and take some time to get folks out there. So I'm going to warm up the stage a little bit because I know I, I know our competitors are probably a little nervous tonight. Um, it's really difficult not only to get on the stage, but to get on the stage in a competitive format where you know that your work is literally going to be judged. Um, and even though we like to live in a judge-free zone, every once in a while the judging is okay because it helps us improve uh, where we're at. Does my love affair with my blackness offend you? Well, maybe you need to hop off Massa's dick and realize that mental slavery is not over. And you're about to receive a tongue lashing upon the back of the craziness that you speak. You see, I have no qualms with acknowledging my roots. It is your ignorance that offends me. Stop rejecting your melanin. I think you have a case of vitiligo of the brain, preaching Latin pride as if it's something separate and distinct. I think your mind is as diluted as your bloodline. Colonial education has brown mouths screaming white power in an effort to drown black pride in bitterness. But my fear does not rest within the steel-toed boots of neo-Nazis. I have anger that rises in me every time I hear a Latino youth spew, I'm not black. Black is exactly what you are, kin, and it is what I am. So every time you shout, I'm not black, not only are you preaching self-hate, but you're making your ancestors turn in their graves did they die in vain so that you could reject them for a colonizer that has robbed you of your history. Take the shackles off your memory, the chemicals in that derrisao got you brainwashed, sister claiming salsa rhythms are what you're all about. Don't you know those congas trace their raices back to Nigeria? Say it loud, soy negra and proud. Don't try to lay your insecurities on me. I know exactly who I be in my skin. Be your mirror. No te, no te confunde. Que hasta en tu sancocho, tu mondongo, tu guanime se encuentra la negra. Soy pura y verdadera. Soy salsa, bomba y la plena. Soy los colores de mi bandera. El rojo como el sangre que corre por mi vena. Soy soledad, la negra. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> so I just lit the stage on fire, and I hope that the rest of your classmates and your schoolmates are going to keep the fire burning. So I'm going to go over to my list, and I'm going to call up the first poet. Really quickly, this is going to be, I'm not going to go through the order. Everybody's been identified by number. I'm only going to call the first student. That first student is going to come up. Um, then we're going to, once that student leaves, the next student is going to come up. And if you get a little bit confused, I'll call by name. Okay, so uh, let's have Jay Mecha. Mecha? Did I pronounce that correctly? Mecha. Mechi. Thank you. Jay Mechi, and again. November 23rd, 1963. And again in the news today, the assassination of President Kennedy shocks peoples across the world. And again in the news today, the assassination of Luther King enrages peoples across the world. April 5th, 1968. 1968, the assassination of Robert Kennedy. September 7th, 1997. Uh, Princess Diana's burial, 2001, uh, September 11th. That's it. September 7th, 1997, Princess Diana's burial. September 12th, 2001, terrorism saturates TV news as two bombs explode at the Boston Marathon. April 6, 2013, and again in the news today, in the news today, and again and again in the news today are stories of death and decay and hurt and panic. According to a nameless man, there is nothing more American than fake bad news. There is blood staining every camera lens. There is trauma across each news anchor's desk, outlets of loss, and rage of the court case for my murder. What does it say of the people still watching? Bodies like me, pupils dilated, eyes unclosed at the crime scene. 
My mother doesn't watch the news anymore. Calls it vicarious trauma, an idea that states, stories of others hurt can exacerbate your own. Every camera angle of a corpse reminds her of the son she's buried before the press. I hear from her it is strange to consider parts of her life have already become history. Books filled with photos of Polaroids that she has bought. Film she has developed. She tells me sometimes everything within the past 10 years feels just like press coverage. How will those books change her story? How will those photos rot my skin is memory so much so the things we learn to leave behind is evidence at the scene the same as her blue hydrangeas at my gravesite this cemetery around me is crashes in the early morning of september my name called between overturned soil and the rope kissing the ceiling i lay my death at the feet of that same nameless man how dare you call my name in front of the press to raise me withering when the nation cries for my mother's face. How dare you pull me down into the earth. If I am to die today, maybe I can drag this all with me. And again, there are cameras still watching after everyone goes home. Well, my people, still watching. I remember the coverage like this, us. Prayers and the church pews. A family of strangers gathered in a circle at the local hospital, hoping we both make it through. Halfway across the nation, my mother and you, never exchanging names, breathless. Eyes glued to the television screen and screaming again, there has to be more. All right, let's. Is this thing on? Am I on? Okay. Um, let's get next. Is this Adam? Nairobi. Sebastian. Uh, Noah. All right. Hi, uh, my name's Noah Mezzacapa. Um, this was written in memory of my grandmother who um, immigrated to the United States from Italy after World War II. Um, and this poem is called, uh, This Poem Was Premature and So Were You. Mm. You died in May, a few days before my birthday, actually. I was born in May. No one should die in May. It's a birth month, not a death month. Everything's in bloom. My birthday's in May. My first thought when I heard was that it's too damn hot out to die. But I guess they have nor'easters where you are. My mother tried to remember something from the week after it happened. She was smiling just a little, and the light from the window shone all yellow and green on her like sunflowers or a hushed laugh. She never looked as beautiful as she did in that moment, talking about sobbing down Carlton Avenue when she realized that Christmas would be different from now on, that dad would be quieter. He asked if she wanted to drive by, but she said no. My father read off a list of all the things that were wrong with you. Gibberish, gobbledygook, it meant nothing to him. It meant nothing to me, and I had half a mind to say so, but it seemed to comfort him some, and I couldn't take that away from him. I was always one for a good list. Lists are for winter, school assignments, calendars, Christmas lists, resolutions for the new year. They weren't meant for May, and neither were you. Thank you. Next, we have contestant number eight. Contestant number eight, Tori. All right, let's hear it. I messed it up, I'm sorry. Give me a second. Hi, I'm Tori Yama, um, and my piece is called Little Kids. A direction of skin complexion among a group of little kids. Judge before they even get to know what this world is. You see, their fates are decided based on the shade of their parents. And before they learn to crawl, they become aware of white privilege and 
white ignorance. And the ladder they have to start climbing before they can walk because it's already been built or should I say bought, the ladder is lined with miseducation and racism and it's broken in places and it's missing rungs because they'll do what they have to to see you fail so they can win and prevail. And as you keep climbing and growing older, the world, well, it just keeps on getting colder. You're just, you're just a kid with the expectations of a race on your head. And it's hard for you to grasp or even halfway understand why all of your life will be working twice as hard to receive only half as much as a white man. And if you're a black woman, well, you're fucked. And why you didn't receive any awards or acknowledgement or any recognition for the life you lead. And every time you turn on the TV, there's another white man being praised. And all they show of the people of your race are the riots and hashtags of an angry place failing to see the pain in a mother's eyes as she witnesses another one of her sons die. And you notice the repetition of history. And suddenly, all the mysteries of why your mom don't let you wear black hoodies, why you need to be home before the street lights come on, why college isn't an option because she breaks her back to put you through school, are no longer mysteries but revealed to you. And you peep how they stereotype your race. You see, they fill you with images of a black man hurting his woman and black men selling drugs on the street just to eat as if that's the only way they can be free. You see, they trap our race within society blaming us for the melanin in our skin, failing to realize we had no choice in it. And as you grow even older, this, this anger you can't begin to describe seeps into your heart at the inequality and that no matter how much or how hard you try, it seems like white is always on top. And it's so, it's so damn crazy. Because once upon a time, we were all just little kids. Thank you. Nice. All right, hold on, let me adjust this. <laughs> All right, how's everybody doing? Can you hand me in the back? All right, cool. All right, my name is Amir, and the piece I'm going to recite for y'all is titled Ballad of the Suffering. Now, if master can make you content with the scraps, you'll never ask for a seat at the table. So do not let them manipulate you like another show horse in the stable. Now they'll say, equal opportunity is here, and racism doesn't exist. And that's such a damn lie, even Ripley wouldn't believe that shit. See, the only way to make it is to put a ball through a hoop or have some really nice rhymes. Or you can sell out to VH1, promoting trash music and fighting baby mamas all the time. Now see, we're pummeled by lackluster talent like Iggy, Lil Yachty and Fetty Wap, combined with slender and TV like Black and Crew, Real Housewives and Love and Hip Hop. And see, we love to watch the drama so we feed them views, only to be confused when the next generation's morals become skewed. See, Uncle Tom's trying to sway you from being an activist so that you can't change the times. Preaching about survival and settling for that crappy nine to five. See, we let them teach us to hate each other. Don't trust thy neighbor and make sure you seal up those borders. Subconscious carrying out the work of that racist pumpkin filling out executive orders. Now see, job opportunity is lacking, but we got plenty of weed. Weave is on point but you still got kids to feed. Absent fathers promote abandonment, and that thought starts to seed because we are a struggling people and everybody's in need. Our neighborhoods will never resemble Midtown or be where the nice buildings are at. Ever wonder why every hood has a liquor store, Chinese restaurant, and laundromat? No need to stay boxed inside your prisons while never exploring past the lines in your zone. Traveling is a blessing, the world is spacious. Go see it on your own. Instead of hating or stealing, we should opt for the assist. Aspire to make real change instead of posting false empowerment to get a like on your statistics. And then when it comes to education, we have to put 130% in just to make it into the workforce because we don't have the complexion for the connection. So I ask my brothers and sisters to open their eyes because only realize can realize the crap that goes on in your life. So when I look at this system, I hate what it's done. And this bias is a joke. 
So the only way to combat it is to band together and stay woke. Thank you. Let's get uh, contestant number 10, Serena, Serena, not here, okay. Contestant number 11, wait, I see somebody moving, are you Serena? No, nope? okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> the spotlight just went on her, I'm sorry. Um, contestant number 11, Chelsea, Chelsea, Chelsea's not here. Contestant number 12, uh, Rita or Rida, is it Rita? Thank you. All right, let's hear it for Rita. Okay, hi, my name is Rita. This is called Humans of the Future. Can this come on? Okay, sorry. <laughs> when I was in the third grade, my teacher gave us an assignment. She asked our class to write down one thing we would want to tell the humans of the future. Uh, a bunch of my friends said they wanted clothes that were cuter, cell phones that were newer, nicer computers, so many ideas were running through my mind, so many ideas but not enough time. I thought about the question, what would I tell the future mankind? I guess I would have started off by telling the humans of the future to raise their kids like a flower. A flower which gives fragrance to even the hand which crushes its petals so that even if fools will cause violence in this world, we will find a solution that will be gentle, putting back the pieces of a world that was disassembled. I would ask, tell the humans of the future to avoid the mistakes we made and make sure the amount of trash on this earth isn't monumental. I would say sorry to them because we treated this earth like a trash can and we should have treated it like a temple. I would ask the humans of the future if Michael Brown or Sandra Bland have become small drops of injustice in an ocean of hate. I would tell them that equality is something that humans should radiate. I would ask the humans of the future if being a different color is still a struggle to survive, if the world still knew genocide, if humanity was still alive, if it had climbed all the mountains and managed to survive. I would tell the humans of the future that being colorblind isn't that bad because at least you're not judging someone based on the pigmentation of their skin. I would tell them that the only colors which matter are the ones which someone has within. I would tell the humans of the future not to judge a girl by a scarf that's on her head, not to spread hate, but to spread love instead because love is what will take us ahead. I would tell the humans of the future that no matter who you love, no matter who it is that you pray to up above, no matter what country you are a part of, promise me you'll be one, promise you'll stay together, promise you'll be united through every endeavor. I was about to write all of this down, but then a thought came to my head and I began to look around. I looked at everyone in my class, every boy, every girl, and I realized we are the humans who can fix the whole world. We're waiting till later, relying on others, expecting the next generation to fix all our blunders. It's like we let time pass us by and spend years unknown, day after day, not knowing how much we've grown, not caring to rebuild the bricks of our home. There's a limited number of times in life somebody can say, I'm young, there's a limited number of times someone can breathe air into their lungs. I wanted to tell the third graders in my class that the world is literally in the palm of your hands. You could silence the wars throughout all the lands because we are right now with air in our lungs, no wrinkles near our eyes and legs that feel brand new. We are right now, there are so many things we could do and maybe, just maybe, if we do something right and our actions spark a flame, 100 years from today, those humans of the future will remember our name. Thank you. Contestant number 13, John. Are you here, John? Let's give it up for John. Well, happy Constitution Day, everybody. It's not my own constitution. I'm from the Netherlands. My name is John Morijn. I'm a visiting researcher here uh, from uh, uh, at the law school uh, researching populism. But it is therefore also my constitution because I'm here with you tonight and I'm enjoying it tremendously already. The piece that I'd like to uh, share with you is called Distortion Mirror. This morning's reflection, what horror Familiar features out of place. Caricature of my normal constitution. Big nose, bloodshot eyes, blo uh, bloated face. Fellow, fellow voters gave me this mirror. Feeling ignored, isolated, enraged. Dysfunction of a democratic solution. Dreams of American dreams upstaged. It's not them, it's me. And I don't like what I see. 
How easy to whack warning fingers, separation of powers and blame. Denouncing underbelly solutions, discussing tweaking rules, not the game. Easier still to set lightning fires, polarize daily projections of fear. To attack cherished institutions, solving nothing, risking what we hold dear. It's not them, it's us. Yes, that's me. I'd like to like better, but I read, hear, and see. Quite comfortable sitting back on Twitter. Difficult to listen, discuss, engage. Although taught just that by any founder, compromise so much harder than outrage. In search of that more perfect union, rust belt truths deserve gazes less cold. Reflecting these will make choices sounder, may return fellow voters to the fold. Again, it's me offering my heartfelt apology. Let's start over together. More equal, more free. Thank you. All right, can we get contestant number 14? Contestant number 14, Francie. Did I pronounce that correctly? Who's Francie? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> All right, let's hear it for Francie. Hi, I'm Francie, and my piece is con or nothing at all. Silence is not golden in my golden years. So, it is a hot, sticky day in Philadelphia. It is a Monday. It is September 17th, and it is 1787. And we are here together, and Benjamin Franklin is about to speak. What he may or may not know is what he is about to say which every one of us have been sworn to secrecy. No constitutional leaks at this constitutional convention will not be tolerated. But what he may or may not know is that James Madison is keeping a handy dandy diary, notating every word, every move, and at the same time, that all these years later, I'm going to get my hot hands on that James Madison diary. And I am going to give my interpretation for you of what Benjamin Franklin said that day in confidence. And while we're on the subject, New York was one of only seven states that could totally participate and totally vote because it had the complete number necessary to be all in. Voting matters. I will not be silenced in my golden years. So here we go. According to Benjamin Franklin, who knew Frank Sinatra? Who knew that Benjamin Franklin and Frank Sinatra would have anything in common? But the song that I've chosen to sing is set to the song that Frank Sinatra became famous for, all or nothing at all. And analogous to Benjamin Franklin, when Frank Sinatra put it out, it was a bust. Indeed, Benjamin Franklin, on this very day, September 17th, 1787, expressed his misgivings about this Constitution. He said, I have grown old, but I am not too old to admit that I know nothing at all, and I know I may change my mind, and I know if we do not do this, despotism is our next step, and that's what we will deserve if we do not take an imperfect risk. Well, Frank Sinatra took a big risk, and guess what? He thought that song went nowhere. And analogous to the Constitution, three years later when there was a strike and Columbia Records bought the company that recorded him singing All or Nothing at All, they were able to release it. And that's why we all know 
who Frank Sinatra is. And we all know who Benjamin Franklin is, not because of his glasses, but because he took a risk on imperfection in the name of something better. So here we go. One, two, three. I said, con or nothing at all. If it's despotism, then there ain't no in-between. Why begin then to dissemble for something that might have been? No, I'd rather, rather have no convention at all. Hey, please don't bring your errors of opinion close to my pen. Don't you opine or I'll law be lost beyond recall. The public good in your eyes and the system approaching so near to perfection as it and my head, not our states, will go dizzy and fall. And if I fall under the spell of your errors, passions, and prejudices, I would be caught sacrificing the public good. Well, you see, I can't say no, con or nothing at all. And if I fell, fell under the spell of your faults, don't you know I'd be caught in the partisan undertow? So you see, I've got to say no, oh no, con or nothing at all. Thank you. All right, I gotta shout somebody out because somebody's cell phone has been going off since the show began. So please take five seconds and silence your cell phones. It's really distracting to the poets when they come up here to hear your dinging, your buzzing, and your ringing. Um, if you like something that you've heard tonight, can I get an okay? okay? If you like something that you've heard tonight, can I get an ow? ow? So I guess we're having a good show tonight. At an early age, you learn the domestication of your sex. Pink plastic Cupid dolls that coo and cry. Susie homemaker kitchens with light up ovens would catch your eye. You learn silence. Speak only when spoken to. Keep your man and his children happy. You learn to love other bodies and hate your own. You learn that breathing was a luxury your corset could not afford you. You learn to use your soft child's voice because it's pleasing to men's ears. You learned. You learn to love misogynists and hate feminists. You became fluent in the language of violence your body a vessel a field to be plowed you learned you learn to look on dramatized rape scenes and affected you learn to look past battered women and children you learn to look down on the weak and envy the empowered you learned you learn to be disgusted by your own period to hate yourself after sex and to cry when you masturbate you learned you learn to hold grudges Grudges against other women, grudges against your mother, grudges against yourself. You learn to live on hot combs, cheap hair dyes, laxatives, and fad diets, overdosing on gossip columns, you learned. You learn to hate. You learn to point, place, and project that hate. You learned that there is nothing wrong with you because you are what you have been taught to be, a domesticated woman. Thank you. And now we're gonna continue on with the second half of our competitors. Can I get contestant number 15, Jay Sean, Jay Sean, Jay Sean, are you here? Come up. Jay Sean, not to be confused with Francie. I saw Jay Sean getting up, and I don't know, people have different names, right? My name is Siri. <laughs> uh, I'm sure. Jay Sean Lee performing um, Considering Mortality or I actually forgot all of this poem, so the first line is the poem and everything else I'm gonna make up. I wanna know, for the sake of all those considering the same lifeless faith as me, how might a man martyr himself and keep breathing? Because just this morning, I remembered a man who took a knee over the fact of a song and lost his own. I am still trying to find all the ways to make myself music and, and may that take my life, may that take anything from me. 
because I refuse to keep waking up every day and forgetting poems and writing new ones about dead and dying black boys and black girls and all those more kin to the invisible the air already makes them. I am sick of trying to compare this body to something that a bullet wants, mm. something that a bullet would try to make lover out of. I wake up and I write lines of dying brown every single day. Just this morning, I tried to write a short poem about trees and how we should uproot them and take that brown, but then I realized why am I writing poems about killing more dead brown things? Mm. Instead, I'd rather let them take this whole body, make lover of me like you did my great-grandmother's great-grandmother, and hickey this whole neck purple until I am too portrait, until I too am something beautiful and gorgeous to look at. Like every lover, I like to wrap around a brace of my shoulders, lynch me just that way too. Hang me just that way too. If I am to choose murder, it will not be bullet. If I am to choose murder, I want tree branch. No, I don't want tree branch, that's some lame shit. If I want to choose murder, if I am to choose the way I am to die, may it be by paper, may it be by poetry, may it be by something I can say I truly loved. I want to wake up and be lynched by Langston. I want to wake up and be hanged by Hodges. I want something I can find myself choking off of and really loving, something that will pierce the other side of this black body before any bullet does. Something I can actually enjoy memorizing and not making up like this very poem I'm spitting off the top of my head for a bunch of gorgeous people on a constitution that probably doesn't even love me. Mm. And I don't know. I say we make a 28th amendment for the sake of National J. Sean Day because I am so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanna say May I be a poet, or may I be a lung savior for all the ways I am tempting to give breath back to you, or may I be mortal no more. Thank you. Contestant number 16, number 16 by the name of Molly. Molly, are you here? Molly, are you here? Molly going once, Molly going twice. And we're gonna go to contestant number 17. Is it Tony or Tani? Tony, Tani? Ow, crowd favorite. Uh, can I just say I really appreciate how you all are supporting each other as you come up to the stage. It's really a beautiful sight. My name is Tony Zambrano and I'll be performing an unhealthy soul. I am a product produce, roots juice for my blood, used for my flesh, I am upset. Who's next, is it the projects, the hood, broken down for no good, Torn down for a Starbucks, brushed with bucks from the corrupt, I am a product produced. My family's flesh was shipped to the Americas, stripped from protection by greed. My grandmother was fed to the capital C, she was the less expensive product sold for the benefit of a corporation. I am what I eat, a slave. We are tempted by our addictions. Weed in the streets is no different than what we eat. Focus on beating the hunger we violently and ignorantly consume. The cries of a cow don't matter now. Their tears aren't meant to fill little kids' bellies. Our ability to strive, our ability to consume organic foods stripped away for the benefit of stripes and stars like our heritage. We are what we eat, genetically modified. But to be in the streets, deceased brother, police called me a dead animal. I guess I am what I eat. My kind can never rest in peace. My kindness can never rest in the peace of a burger. So we are not what we eat, but we are. We are a generation, but no different than cows in a farm, torn from the inside out, used for our flesh, juice for our blood. Don't expect us to know our family tree when you separated us from our roots. Our DNA is swinging from that poplar tree. Can't you see those strange fruits? Blood on the leaves. You use my family tree because you want it to go green. The fucking irony. Struggling daily to live off a of food that can kill. 
and it fundamentally structures my unhealthy soul. Crowd favorite, crowd favorite. Uh, let's get contestant number 18 up here. Keiko, Keiko, let's go. Hello, everybody. My name is Keiko Zano. Can I take this off? I will be performing my poem entitled Dear Honesty. Dear Honesty. You and me aren't aware of my true identity. Am I supposed to continue this inevitable flow of all my brothers always trying to outshow on the streets? Continue a cycle of making kids but not having enough to eat. You see now there's an internal duel within me that's struggling to see which side I should be. Because the society can't seem to wonder my despair that's so deep under just because I don't seem to mutter. I don't know if it's a question to you that I, who seems successful, is really just a lonely mess full of internal stress that I'm really in a mental crisis, but I bet you wouldn't guess because I never confessed that I was growing up numb to the adversities of poverty that seemed like I shunned. At home, one burger was shared between my siblings and me because mom had to figure out a way to stop our hunger. And to be honest, my daddy was a crackhead like any black man in America, dead. And he was only worried about his own funds, holding guns and creating more sons. But you wouldn't guess because I'm not being modest. And I'm stuck struck guessing to conform to this capitalistic monk. To be honest, I'm confused that I'm only good for being used for this white world's pleasure and entertainment like a show nigga, kind of like that slave shit. And to be honest, I don't know where to go, but all I truly know is that conforming to this society's greed for only wanting more will only lead to my misery and endless uncertainty of what else I could be. And to be honest, to be honest, I'm quite lost and unsure if I should, I'm lost and I'm unsure if I should continue this and abandon my brothers and sisters to be teenage mothers and gangsters, or should I follow the fist and the fro to, or the brothers as light as, the white as snow? To be honest, I don't know if I should leave and or succeed, which is just another term on how to achieve more greed, but I hope you excuse my ignorance because I truly don't know my true significance. Yeah. All right, let's get contestant number 19. Contestant number 19, Jaylin, Jaylin, Jaylin coming to the stage. My name is Jalen Grace Ortiz, and this is a poem I wrote called Found the Love. She looked into the mirror and smiled, although it wasn't real. She fixed her hair and dried her eyes and tried not to feel the pain in her heart, the anxiety in her mind. She nodded her head and practiced saying, I'm fine. Her mom left, her dad didn't care. He drank and drank and drank, and he sweared he loved her. But then he hit her. Where's the love? He confused her for her mother when he was on the drugs, and he said he wouldn't care if she died. Where's the love? They struggled monthly to get by, so her father would get high as she'd sit in her room and cry, where is the love? One night it was too much. She couldn't find the love, so she took too much of over-the-counter drugs. She still woke up. The drugs had expired, and her mother returned to pull her from the fire, so she felt some love. CPS took her out, and her dad OD'd on drugs. She cried out for him. He failed to ever find the love. So she developed resiliency from consistently being hurt and let down. She lived in poverty but refused to let that keep her down. She turned to school as an outlet and campaigned against drugs. She worked arduously, and eventually she found the love. Within herself, she had finally found the love, and her hard work paid off. She got into the college of her dreams, NYU. She was one of the first in her family to even graduate from high school. She had finally made her way out, her way out of the wild. So she looked into the mirror and smiled. Thank you.
Contestant number 20, Amisa. So, my name is Amisa Rosari, and I will be performing a poem called We the People. Man, okay. We the people. We the people allow. Okay, I'm gonna start. Oh, it doesn't restart? It doesn't restart? Okay, yeah, thanks. You're awesome. Okay. All right. We the people. We the people allow the suppressors and supremacists scare and stray our souls from becoming superiors. We need to let them know that they do not define us. They tell us to stand, yet we have no feet. They want us to rise as one, yet we have no arms. They scream for us to have strength, yet no strength remains. We the people. We the people are no longer people, bodies. We are souls, broken souls, scared souls, hopeless souls, lost and hidden. Hidden by the fixed mentality that we may lose. Why? Why don't we believe we have a base or power, utter strength? Why have we allowed ourselves to fall victim? Why have we given up? Why? Why were we born in the same world yet allow ourselves to no longer exist? Why, why may we fail? In, why, we, why may we fall into the pit of agony and disdain? Why have we allowed society create our limitations that lower expectations and give us a duration for success? Why do they make us seem weak, spineless, unworthy? Like we just aren't good enough, like we don't belong, like success, power, and strength are alien to us, that we the people are incapable of meeting the means for success, that we are irrelevant. So many whys rather than why not? Why not show them our resilience? Why not embody transcendence? Why not create our own statistics? Why not shape our own reality? Why we have no limits? We have encountered life's true authenticity. The oppressors will never feel as the oppressed do. They may try to knock us down or even kick us while we're there, but we are the people, the people who can stand as one, the people who are going to, the people who are going to be successful, the people who define themselves, the people who will set things straight, the, disingenu the disingenuous individuals, the ignorant individuals, the headstrong, closed-minded, and artificial individuals will never be a part of the people. Forget how they think. We refuse to sink and will change the world with one blink of their eye. The apparent eye of all known, the eye that determines capabilities, the eye that has been, still is, and will always be blinded. Blinded by the artificial perception of society's range for success. But again, we remind ourselves, we can, we have, and we will. We are the people. Thank you, you guys are so good. All right, contestant number 21, contestant number 21, Lydia. Hi, my name is Lydia Mason, and this is my poem, Dear America. Dear America, I think we need to talk. The constitution of this relationship isn't working out. I think we need an amendment. On our first date, you promised I would always be free to express myself. But when I told you how I hated the way you looked and your racism, you threw tear gas in my eyes and convinced me I was only crying because of your beauty. On date two, you said I would always be protected around you. But you broke my fists when I raised them in resistance, blackened my eyes when they witnessed your injustice, shattered my knees when they knelt in earnest and shot my heart when it felt the pain of the millions you've oppressed. When we first met, I saw 
the dreams that you had of justice pour out of your mouth like crashing waves. Hopes of freedom and equality collided through the air. You said it would always be us. We, the people. I thought we were the perfect union, but how could we be perfect when the gifts you gave me were stolen? The labor of the black slave, the land of the Native Americans, the freedom of the imprisoned Japanese, the dreams of the undocumented immigrant. On our 13th date, you promised things would be different that you would finally learn how to love me. But your love affair with shackles and chains is far from over. You just gave it a different name, told me I deserved it because I broke your rules, that I took the wrong steps, that I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, that I didn't even deserve to be here. Dear America, how am I supposed to win your game when you decided I would lose before I could even play? Dear America, you were never great. You just told a great story. One I hope comes true. But until it does, I'll be standing here, being your guiding light. Signed, Your Lady Always, Liberty. Contestants to go. Uh, can we get contestant number 22, Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. Hi, my name's Ryan. Um, this is not political at all, but yeah. It's titled Untitled. How could you do that to me? I don't think I'll ever understand. The breaking of your heart sent waves across time that caught up to my heart now that echoes for eternity. I'll feel your pain inside of me until the day I die. Emotions surge like the tide. You come and go, just like my feelings for you do. One day, I'll be able to forgive you, but I do not think today is that day, because today, the echo rose into a scream that shook me until I cried. I couldn't keep it in any longer. I buried your skeleton deep in the grave of my repressed memories, but it haunts me, just like your presence haunts me, just like your absence haunted me, and now your ghost is here to stay. It whispers your mistakes in my ears. It pokes holes in my soul, pointing out how broken and fragile I am. Your scream vibrated me, vibrated me to the point of rupture, and now my hollow shards ricochet inside my consciousness. I thought I had forgiven you. I don't remember the last time I told myself such a bad lie. You left me alone in the wilderness when I needed you most. You left me to fend for myself. But sometimes, the abandoned cups survive. They learn the cold reality that was your love, or rather the lack of it. They grow up to spite you, to show you just how wrong you were to abandon them. And now that they're grown, they howl at the moon, just like a howl at your scream. But you've returned into my life, and I don't know how to feel. I don't know how to feel at all. I don't know what feeling is anymore. But you're just like the moon. So I'll howl at you until you fade into the stardust you were born of. Um, I'll howl at you until you fade into the stardust you were born of. And I'll wait for the next time you show your face. Such a pale light may illuminate my broken pieces so, that, so I can remind you of what you did to the one person who cared about you the most. Yes, the moon will return and so will the wolves, but soon the moon will wane into oblivion, and I'll fall back into my sleep of ignorance, awaiting the next time I feel your pain inside me. Don't ever let anybody tell you that love is not political. <laughs> uh, let's get uh, contestant number 23, Justin. Oh! They were not playing when they put you down by the end. <laughs> okay. 
All right. <laughs> Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Justin Ebron and the piece I'll be performing is called Fading. All right, so this is a call and response. When I say ah, you say love. Ah. Love. You. Ah. Love. You. She sang the sweetest songs. And I hope from that day everything would be all right. We found love unconditionally. Through a few plays of a song, we formed a bond unintentionally. We talked about our lives and what we wanted to be. We talked about our future. Then you mentioned me. I thought you had no other plans than to stay with me. But you wrapped me in your web, planted in me an omnia seed. You invited me to your place. We were in a rush. But I was in a motive to relinquish my love. I couldn't wait. Knock, knock. She opened the door, looked at my date. Her curly hair, thick body, and face is what sealed my fate. We went into her house, but we couldn't keep the pace. One minute we were sitting in an awkward space in an awkward place. And then you just started to unlace. I kicked off my shoes and our souls intertwined as we experienced pleasure through sin. It was our first time, but we didn't have time to waste. But once it was over, I felt strange. I tasted your lips and they tasted strong. They gave me life, gave me soul. I felt tenacious, I felt bold, I felt like I was on top of the world. But that strange feeling wrapped around my head. I knew I gave something I couldn't get back. I made a deal with the devil. You put a spell on me, on my heart, my pure, innocent heart. I took a bite from the snake's fruit bearing on the tree and now, I felt my consciousness focused only on you. After that night, we barely spoke, barely chatted, but I was still rattled, still shook. I craved you in every woman I ever saw after that day, but you never felt the same way. Or I can only assume since our love never found the resolve or resume, it just managed to dissolve into the abyss that used to be my heart. You changed the way I think, breathe, and love, I wonder if you spend nights thinking about me. I wonder if you even care about me. I wonder if you were just a character in the movie scene, playing your role and playing me till the, till the film stopped filming. Playing me like a game of cards, you the queen, me the joker. Never thought you'd take my heart away and keep it as a token. Never imagined after I saw your eyes, my heart would be broken. She sang the sweetest songs. And I hope from that day forward, everything would be all right. When I say ah, the distant sounds of love continue to fade as I remember you. All right, all right. So we're coming up on our last contestant of the night, our last contestant of the night. After all of our contestants are done, our judges are going to have a little bit of time to finish their calculations. Then we're going to bring up the third, second, and first place winners. Don't worry if you don't make it into third, second, or first. Just being here tonight is honor enough, in my humble opinion. Can we get number 24, Nairobi? I'm Nairobi, and this is a poem called Dubiety, basically meaning anything that causes doubt. Dubiety. They used to see us in chains. When we did not have them on, they saw them on us, hanging at our ankles, hanging from our wrists, shut around any open throat able to speak out. It had to be quiet, so fear could be spoken. The first thing he noticed was how hope and other words of protest left hanging midair don't have to stand in solidarity with all the black bodies bound there. Fear told us some were too leaden to be lifted, 
that someone had to be afflicted by all of the bad nature had seemingly been prescripted. And fear chose me. Fear chose you too and marginalized any people possible to be the dark obstacle in the way of the white man. But this white man known as savior is just another fucked up flavor of fear's construction, made ingrained and too complex to ever be obstructed. A reluctant price for the lives of the marginalized was this conceived superior, wrapped up with bow and benefit in a perfectly perfect exterior. But when has perfect ever been attainable? In this day and age, we show got faith in, fa in the facade as if that shit was sustainable. Fear conceived this construction of whiteness as a mission to rob humanity of nature's resource and her rightness. For those who uphold this deceptive conception, his control is evident. It comes alive in a spite that sours the taste of those privileges gifted to them. Just ask those po whites pouring their day-to-day -day strife in heaven and hatred to uplift a dream that doesn't really mean shit. That man is not my goddamn president. See, I'm gonna read this whiteness for what the fuck it is. An unattainable perfectionism built right into Adam's ribs. It swathes him in comfort from cradle to crib, but that dissonance sets in whenever Adam realizes. His granddaddy broke backs and burned the blood of blacks who looked any different than him. All in the name of fear and his felonious fibs. In this history lives an admission of guilt and contrition, so does it really have you shook that color of skin has been built to be the method of definition for deserved death and financial demolition? It was easy stock for fear to confine Adam's mind with. I mean, that was the first thing his eye could identify without much thought of the soul learning how to live inside. Fuck the love that connects all of us, right? That's some stuff we don't wanna discuss, but your skin boy, that's the shit that ought to get you shot. Don't worry. You'll be buried in decaying truth, wrapped in bruises of black and blue, made pretty in death in the deep breaths heard as forget-me-nots land on your casket. A black boy in a black box. I see it where they say it's not. I see it in lives limited to page numbers and nightly news images on Channel 5. I see it in a system that can contrive walls of separation, disguised to hide my nature, devised to hide you from me, devised to hide me from me too. This hate is synthesized, and macrame made to mass produce lies. Fear must fight every day in vanity to be louder than free love, nature, and her humanity. In these mishaps made mundane by the repetition and emotional ignorance, I pray you remember what is natural. Free love and bountiful provision, where hate is the clear derision that is weakened by our inherent cognition. This life is limited only by time, never by dominion. They saw us silent, so I can never consign that sight to oblivion. Humanity was not created to be hidden, and that's the me that I've chosen to believe in. I'm no black bitch that needs to be baptized in silence. We weren't born to be burdens of the devil's consequence. He has made self-doubt domestic, so it is only his dubiety that feeds into anxiety. Beat, beat, beats to the rhythm of the clave. Caribbean sun kissed skin, mi piel café con leche. Coffee bean colored, these are the eyes of my mother. Raised by the Bronx musing on medleys of salsa, pouring Hector, Frankie, Celia, Ruben from apartment windows, inspiring spontaneous song and dance from locals watching games of domino on city sidewalks. Childhood memories of syrupy sweet tamarindo piraguas and playing in pompas to cool down on heat drenched summer city days. We eagerly anticipated the Puerto Rican Day Parade with our banderas held high. We shouted, Wepa! Que viva Puerto Rico, Isla del Encanto y Amor de mi alma. Never questioning whether our pride was innate or instilled, we were raised to love all of who we were, and mommy didn't tolerate ignorance. We were fed on strict diets of penil, arroz con gandules y yuca. We ate barrio frituras and drank jugo de guayaba from Goya cans. Christmas meant pasteles, arroz con dulce y coquito, and an extra present for leaving grass under your bed para los reyes magos. We took annual pilgrimages to Borinquen, island of my mother's birth, Island of my soul's content, a chance to become one con nuestra raíz cultural. Bright-eyed and hopeful, we sang schoolgirl choruses of Alegre vengo de la montaña, 
de mi cabaña que alegre están y a mis amigos les traigo flores de las mejores de mi Rosal. Time spent con mami Panchita, mis tíos y tías, I miss my grandmother's eyes. Knowing Papito Kike from old tales y Mama Chonga, a testament to an ancestry rooted in slavery. A return to New York City, Nueva York, where school buildings are named after Tito Puente, Julia de Burgos, y Felisa Rincón de Gautier. We hung images of Don Pedro Albizu Campos in our homes. We were fluent in Spanglish. Raised on a mixed bag of El Chavo del Ocho, Grease, Sábado Gigante, Mary Poppins, and we watch Iris Chacón Shake that cadera on television. Este orgullo was born in me, rooted in my mother's journey, grounded in New York cement with divine inspiration. I pen my history. This is my story, a tale of two cultures, two languages, one New Yorican, one me. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Give another round of applause to these poets. Please, 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 every single poet that got up on the stage, okay? Judges, how we doing? We got numbers for me? Not quite yet. All right, so we're going to take a little intermission. I'll talk with some of you who want to chat me up. And if not, if you're hungry, there's some fresh snacks in the back. I see fruit. I see granola bars. I see water. <laughs> Who's ready? Who's ready? Who's ready to hear these winners? All right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to announce the place. We'll start with third, then we're going to go to second, then we're going to go to first. I'm going to bring up the contestants so that they can bask in their glory here and you can applaud them. Um, and then right after we name all of the winners, we're going to bring all the poets up so that we can have a nice uh, photo op of everybody who uh, participated tonight. So we're going to start with third place. Can I get a drum roll, please? All right, in third place, splitting third place, the points were identical. We have Tony Sambrano and Tori Ama, or Amal. Woo! Let's go, let's go. <laughs> so our third place contestants are gonna go home with $50 each, $50 each. That's Okay, that's Starbucks money. <laughs> um, in, in second place, in second place, we have Rita Ali. Rita Ali, come down here. Now, I have to tell you guys, even from over here at the podium listening to, to the poets, I'm, I really felt bad for the judges <laughs> because you all gave them a lot of heat and a lot to work with, uh, so I'm sure it was not easy making these decisions. Um, let's get that drum roll going. for the, This is our first place, our first place winner of the night. Can we have Lydia Mason come up to the stage? So just in case I didn't announce it, our second place winner is going home with $100. And our first place uh, winner is going home with $150. Now, there's a part of my brain that wants to say, spend that on your textbooks, but then there's another part of my brain <laughs> that wants to say, take yourselves out for a steak dinner, because I know college life is hard, and you don't get to eat that many good meals. All right, so take yourselves out to a steak dinner. Congratulate these folks, please, and thank you. Amazing, 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 amazing. And can we get all of the contestants on the stage, all of the contestants on the stage, if you came up tonight and you put your heart on this stage, get up here now, please.
Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you all 